Part 1 of An Excursion to the Lakes in Westmoreland and Cumberland, August 1773, by William Hutchinson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Bowes to Appleby Whenever I have read the descriptions given by travellers of foreign countries, in which their beauties and antiquities were lavishly praised, I have always regretted a neglect which has long attended the delightful scenes at home. The monuments of antiquity dispersed over this island are many and various. Some of them arose in the remotest ages, and point out to us the revolutions and history of our own kingdom, a degree of knowledge which ought to stand first in importance with every Englishman. These sentiments gave rise to a summer's excursion, the pleasures of which I have endeavoured to communicate to the reader in the following pages. The first requisites for a pleasure jaunt are companions of suitable taste and curiosity, and conveniences for the journey. They increase every enjoyment, and make every scene which presents itself more agreeable. These were not wanting. Thus circumstanced, we were conducted to Bowes in Yorkshire, to which place I shall first attempt engaging the attention of the reader. Bowes is of great antiquity, in which is all its merit. The country around it is meanly cultivated, its habitations are melancholy, and what alone claims the attention of a traveller is the ruin of a castle, supposed by some to have been of Roman construction, but by others to be the Turris de Arquebus, built by Allen, first Earl of Richmond, in the Conqueror's time. It is situated on the old Roman way, which leads from Catherick, or the ancient Cataractonium. The castle is 53 feet high, is built of hewn stone of excellent workmanship, forming a square of equal sides of 81 feet each. The windows are irregular, and the walls, which are cemented with lime mixed with small flints, are near five feet in thickness. It is now much defaced, the outward casing having been stripped off in many places. Within, it appears to have been divided into several apartments, one of the lower divisions of which was supported by a central pillar, from whence a roof of arches has arisen, the groin still projecting from the walls. This castle is situated on the brink of a hill, declining swiftly to the southward, at whose foot runs the river Greta. It is surrounded with a deep ditch on the south side of which is a plain or platform, apparently calculated for the use of the castle. On the eastern point of this platform, we were shown the site and remains of a bath, with its aqueduct, which are now totally in ruins, and grown over with weeds and brambles. On a late enclosure of some common lands belonging to Bowes, an ancient aqueduct was discovered, which had conveyed the water from a place called Levar, or Levy Pool, near two miles distant from the castle, which was sufficient at once to supply the garrison with fresh water, and also the baths. A few scanty meadows border the river Greta, and cultivation seems to awake in ignorance over the adjoining lands, where the ploughshare begins to make the traces of industry on the skirts of the desert. Another occasion, besides what is mentioned by Camden, may have given the modern name of Bowes, as this place was granted by William the Conqueror to one of his attendant adventurers. The ancient monuments, said by Camden to be in the church of Bowes, are not now to be discovered. Neither are there any other antiquities there which can afford any light to the history of the place. From Bowes proceeding towards Westmoreland, we were respited from the sad scene of barrenness to which we were obliged to pass by some infant enclosures and attempts towards cultivation. The climate, the dreary vicinage of mountains and the inclement skies seem to deny industry her natural rewards. At length Spittal presents its solitary edifice to the view, behind which Stainmore arises, whose heights receive the burthen of both eastern and western storms. As we advanced, a dreary prospect was extended to the eye. The hills are clothed in heath, and all around is a scene of barrenness and deformity. The lower grounds are rent with torrents, which descend impetuously from the steeps in winter, and chasms which are harrowed on the sides of the hills, yawn with ragged rocks, or black and rotten earth. 
Here and there, some scattered plots of grass variegate the prospect, where a few sheep find pasturage, and now and then a little rill is seen in the deep dell, which, as it flows with disconsolate meanderings, is tinged with the sable soil through which it passes. No habitation for mankind appears on either side, but all is wilderness and horrid waste, over which the wearied eye travels with anxiety. At the door of the turnpike house on Stainmore stands a cylindrical stone, which seems to have been a Roman guide-post, but the inscription is so obliterated that it cannot now be made out. When we approach Roy Cross, mentioned by Camden, which is now the boundary stone dividing Yorkshire from Westmoreland, we perceived it stood within the remains of a large entrenchment, defended by banks of earth ten paces wide, through which the present turnpike road now passes. Its form is an oblong square, extending from north to south with two openings on every side of the square, immediately opposite to each other, defended by a mound of earth placed right in front of each pass, now rising from the plain about five perpendicular feet, which is near the height of the entrenchment in its highest part. The eastern side is 270 paces in length. The openings on the side are 10 paces wide. The moles which defend the same are 36 paces in circumference, and stand 10 paces from the outward edge of the entrenchment. The ascent of the adjoining ground on this side is gradual for near half a mile. The northern end is 249 paces in length, with two openings therein, defended by moles of earth, similar to those on the eastern quarter, and as the ground here is flat for a considerable distance, so this part of the entrenchment was by nature rendered inaccessible from the north by a deep morass. The western side is similar to those before described, being 278 paces in length, standing on a swift descent which falls without intermission for half a mile or upwards. The southern end is in length, 181 paces, has its openings and moles as before described, but stands on the brink of a precipice of considerable height. On the highest ground within the entrenchment is a large mound of earth, of a square figure, arising from the plain near three perpendicular feet, and in circumference 53 paces. We have no account of this entrenchment in history, and are left to conjecture to what people it might belong. As it lies on the Roman road, it strikes one with an apprehension that it was of Roman original, but the singularity of the passes and mounds which guard them do not correspond with their usual mode of fortifying a camp, though the interior mound may well be esteemed the Praetorium. From the conflicts between the Northern English and the Normans after the conquest, and preceding William ceding Cumberland to the Scots, this place may be conceived to have been a camp of one of those powers. As we travelled from hence for several miles, all around was one continued scene of melancholy, the hills increasing in height, the valleys deepening and growing more desolate, the wind sounded among the rocks, whilst a heavy vapour in some parts clouded their summits. In others, driving rain was seen streaming along the dells, and shrouding their gloomy recesses. The wearied mind of the traveller endeavours to evade these objects, and please itself with the fancied images of verdant plains, of streams and happy groves, to which we were approaching. Whilst we were thus engaged, unexpectedly the scene opened, and from such a horrid wild gave us a prospect as delightful as the other was disgusting. Over a rugged and rocky foreground, we looked upon Stainmore Dale in front. Her verdant meadows cheered the eye, her sweet sequestered cottages, her grassy plains and little shades of sycamores, seemed enchanting, as their beauties were enhanced by the deformity from which they had escaped. On the right hand a mountain arises, immersing its grey head and naked brow in clouds. The sides are barren rocks, in whose chinks here and there a few shrubs are seen clinging, and cast a tint of green to variegate the storm-bleached precipice. On a wild and forlorn situation, in an opening on the side of a mountain, Helbeck Hall is discovered, covered with trees. The place seems calculated for discontent, and hidden from all that is cheerful in the world, is befitted to a mind of disappointment and despair. All its prospect is barrenness. The voice of waterfalls, of breezes mourning in the branches of the copse, or hissing in the fissures of the rock, its music. Day-excluding shadows make it gloomy, 
and overhanging vapours damp and dreary. Yet Helbeck has its beauties. It contrasts with the vale beneath, where the far outstretching plain reaches to the very bounds of Cumberland, whose lofty mountains were seen from our then station, tinged with blue vapours, and mixing their summits with the sky. In the foreground lays Bruff, whose ancient castle, formerly the seat of Pembrokes, affords a noble object, around which rich meadows dressed in the brightest green and fresh verdure after mowing, plots of ripening corn, sparkling sheets of water seen through the trees which deck their margins, the windings of each brook, little groves of ash and sycamore, fantastically dispersed and intermixed with villages and cots, form the beauties of the vale, on this hand extending towards Kirby Stephen, on that to Dufton, and in front as far as Penrith Beacon. As we begun to descend the hill towards Bruff and leave Stainmore's desert, we passed near an ancient Roman fortification called Maiden Castle. The Roman road has led immediately through it. It forms a square and has been built of stone. Each side of this square is forty paces in length and is defended by outworks, the nearest being a small ditch with a breastwork of large stones set erect, and the outward one a ditch and mound of earth. This place has been of great strength in former times from its natural situation, commanding the pass from Bruff. The ascent on the side opposite to Bruff is very steep for upwards of a mile. To the south it is inaccessible by reason of the precipice on whose brink it stands, and towards the north the ground is everywhere rugged and mountainous. The night was spent at Bruff. Fatigue gives a relish beyond what the sons of ease can possibly experience in the midst of their luxury. Beds of down are only conscious of anxiety and weariness, to restless ambition and greatness. The peasant, breathing health from his labours, sleeps emparadised on his bed of contentment and chaff. Bruff is now divided into two small mean towns, the one called Church Bruff, the other Market Bruff, separated by a little brook which falls into the River Eden. Husbandry is very little advanced here. The management of grassland is the farmer's whole excellence, the meadows being kept in good order and very wealthy. The inhabitants are ignorant of men and manners, but subtle and crafty. On parties of pleasure, time should never be limited. To ride post through a country is too much the custom of travellers, by which they can reap no more than a general idea of it. The speculative traveller is never confined to roads, times or seasons but as the circumstances exciting his curiosity lay either to the right or left, he pursues the objects of his attention without regard to hours or rules. The pleasantness of the morning called us very early from Bruff. The dawn advanced with a deep calm. The clouds broke from the hills and drew their grey veil from the face of morning, revealing her in blushes. All the valley lay wrapped in stillness. Care and industry had not departed from their night's recesses. The ear was hushed and all around seemed to be the region of tranquillity. Ere it was long, various sounds grew on the sense, and the living landscape gave us new pleasures, where the busy cottagers were all abroad in the several occupations of the field. As we pursued our journey, at an opening of the road to the left we viewed the ruins of Bruff Castle. In former times this was a formidable fortress, and said to be of Roman construction. The building to the eastern side is semicircular and seems to be of modern architecture, but to the west there remains a noble tower, apparently of great antiquity and built in the form and style of other Roman edifices in the north of England. The whole castle stands on a very considerable eminence, arising swiftly from the plain, and by its outworks shows it to have been a place of great strength. In the beginning of the last century it was repaired by the Countess of Pembroke, who made it her residence. This appeared to be an inscription that lately stood over the south entrance, which also described that it had suffered by fire and laid in ruins above a century preceding. The stone which contained this inscription some few years ago fell down and was destroyed. As the sun advanced, he gave various beauties to the scene. The beams streaming through the divisions in the mountains showed us their due perspective and striped the plain with gold. The lights falling behind the castle presented all its parts perfectly to us. Through the broken windows, distant objects were discovered. The front ground laid in the shadows. 
on the left, the prospect was shut in by a range of craggy mountains, on whose steeps shrubs and trees were scattered. To the right a fertile plain was extended, surmounted by distant hills. Over their summits the retiring vapours, as they fled the valley, dragged their watery skirts, and gave a solemn gloom to that part of the scene. Behind the building, the lofty promontory of Wilbore Fell lifted its brow, tinged with an azure hue, and terminated the view. Half mankind know nothing of the beauties of nature, and waste in indolence and sleep the glorious scene which advancing morning presents. As we passed on, the varied prospect kept attention exerted. At the distance of a mile from Brough, the village of Walkup to the left affords an agreeable view. Walkup Hall, shrouded with a rich wood of sycamores, overtops the village. The verdure of the meadows, with some extensive fields of yellow corn, contrasted by the hills of pasture grounds which lay on the southern side, brown with summer heat and tufted with brushwood, gave a pleasing variety. Whilst the morning beam breaking a slant upon the valley and glistening upon the brook with the blue tints of smoke that arose from the hamlets, painted the rural scene. We were furnished with ideas which still rendered the prospect more pleasing, as they reminded us of the social spirit of the owner of Walkup, in whose life hospitality and benevolence are truly characterised. The valley, now growing more extensive, increased its varieties, and pleased us with a new scene of advancing cultivation and husbandry. The large tracts of ground which we passed along were lately common, but are now dividing and forming into enclosures. At the sixth milestone, we stopped to admire the singularity of the view to the right, where a range of mountains, arising from the extensive plain over which we were travelling, stretched to the westward and afforded a romantic and noble scene. The nearest hills, with rocky brows and barren cliffs, raised their grey fronts above the brushwood which girted them in the midst, whilst their feet in hasty slopes descended into the vale in pasturage, Further retiring from the eye, the mountain called Cross Fell, with a front of naked stones, overtops all the adjoining hills, being said to exceed the mountain of Skiddo, 110 perpendicular feet in height. Further extending westward, the chain of mountains lay in perspective till they died away upon the sight, and in azure hue seemed to mix with the sky, whilst at the foot of this vast range of hills, three small amounts of an exact conic form running parallel, beautified the scene, being covered with verdure to their crowns. The nearest, called Dufton Pike, was shadowed by a passing cloud, save only the summit of its cone, which was touched by a beam that pointed it with gold. The second pike was all enlightened, and gave its verdure to the prospect, as if mantled with velvet. The third laid shadowed, whilst all the range of hills behind were struck with the sunshine, showing their cliffs, their caverns and their dells in strange and grotesque variety, and giving the three pikes a picturesque projection on the landscape. As if nature delighted to charm the eye of man, she at this time cast an accidental beauty over the scene. The small clouds which chequered the sky as they passed along spread their flitting shadows on the distant mountains and seemed to marble them a beauty which I do not recollect has struck any painter, and which has not been described even by the bold hand of the immortal Poussin. The most exquisite fancy of a painter could not have devised a more pleasing variety of light and shadow than what was cast upon this prospect. Appleby, to which we now approached, though placed on a very elevated situation, was concealed from our view till we arrived within half a mile, when from the hill which we had ascended, it gave us an agreeable surprise. On the brink of a lofty eminence, fronting towards the east, at whose foot runs the river Eden, the castle presented itself. The steep on whose brow this noble edifice is erected is richly clothed with wood, save only where a rugged cliff of a red hue breaks through the trees and gives an agreeable variety to the landscape. The front of the castle which presented itself is irregular and antique, but loses great share of its beauty by the joints of the building being whitened and bedaubed with lime. Over this front the top of a fine square tower is discovered, whose corners arise in turrets. The landscape to the left is richly wooded, 
To the right it is divided by hanging gardens which adjoin to the town, overtopped with the dwellings. The pavilions belonging to the house of John Robinson Esquire, with the parterres and sloping plots of grass ground, modernise a scene which condemns all factitiousness of taste, and by the simplicity and elegance nature presents to us on the adjoining lands, reproves the distortions which she receives from dull right lines and angles. But whilst I censure fashion, I revere the owner of the mansion, whose excellencies are too eminent to want the traveller's applause. As we approached the bridge and cast our eyes up the valley, we were delighted with the happy assemblage of woods and meadows which form the little vale where the Eden flows. Through the thronging branches the water was seen in many places, reflecting a tremulous beam and sparkling in the sun's rays. Over the valley, red cliffs and rocks, on this hand, appear projecting through the trees. On that is seen the lofty front of the castle. The prospect from the terrace which is under the eastern front of the castle is very beautiful. To the right, the river Eden forms a winding lake for the distance of half a mile, whose banks are clothed with lofty hanging woods, descending in a swift but regular sweep to the brink of the stream. Below us the water murmured over a weir, where a mill added to the pleasing sounds. On the left red cliffs and precipices arise perpendicular from the water, over whose brows oaks and ashes hanging, render their aspect more romantic by the solemn shade. On the ground above, the public road leading to Appleby winds up the hill, on whose sides some cottages are scattered, whilst all behind mountains form the distant ground, shadowed with clouds. Whilst we stayed here enjoying this sweet scene, I could not forbear pointing out to my companion a little tenement which stood opposite to us, near to the brink of the river, where the fairest maid resides that graces Eden's banks. Stately and tall, she seems the lily of Eden's garden, while she is fair and meek as lilies too. In her countenance beauty is graced with intelligence, and in her behaviour innocence is mixed with politeness. The garden grounds around Appleby Castle are without ornament, and are calculated for use only. On the western side, detached from the rest of the edifice, is a very lofty square tower, which the people call Caesar's Tower, and which from its form appears to be Roman. The corners form a projection of near a foot from the plane of each front, and rise above the rest of the building in square turrets, now covered with lead, the remaining part of the top being embrasured. There are two small windows on each front near the middle of the building, parallel to each other. This tower is defended by an outward wall, forming a kind of crescent at the distance of about twelve paces, now remaining near twenty feet in height. Strongly sustained on the outside by buttresses, erected on an eminence thirty paces in ascent, and defended by a deep ditch without, the quarter fronting to the castle lies open to the area which is enclosed by a wall continuing from the points of the crescent. The great hall is worthy the observation of travellers, there being enclosed in a case in the wainscot, a fine piece of portrait painting of the Pembroke family, ornamented with their pedigree, and historical notes of their lives and achievements. A stranger is from thence conducted through an adjoining room, where the ragged remains of embroidered furniture give you a most deplorable idea of decaying magnificence, and the vanity of pride. When the doors of a closet being suddenly thrown open, you are startled from your reverie by the shaking of armour, and the sight of a complete suit trembling in every joint. This armour is preserved with great attention as having been worn by the late Earl of Westmoreland, who has been a man of very small stature. The arms are richly embossed and inlaid with gold. In its ichnography, this castle is not much unlike to the ruins of Bruff the towers being detached from the main edifice and placed to the west. Appleby Castle is one of the seats of the Earl of Thanet, but of late years has been much neglected by the family. Lord Thanet is hereditary sheriff of the county of Westmoreland, and is entitled to many noble privileges there, some of which in this age of liberty and cultivation are rather oppressive. His free chase in particular. The great possessions of the Countess of Pembroke in this country came into the Thanet family in the following manner. John, Earl of Thanet, succeeded his mother, Margaret, Countess of Thanet, as Baron of Clifford, Westmoreland and Vesey, 
in the year 1676, and in the year 1678 he also succeeded his cousin, the Lady Aliathia, sole daughter and heir of James Earl of Northampton, by his first wife, the Lady Isabella, his mother's sister, whereby he became possessed of the whole inheritance of his grandmother, the Countess of Pembroke. The town of Appleby chiefly consists of one wide continued street, hanging upon the swift decline of a hill, in a direction north and south, the castle terminating it on the summit, the church at the foot. The situation is delightful in the summer season, but in the winter very cold, the natural disadvantages of its site being increased by the great scarcity of coal to supply which want, wood and peats are chiefly used as fuel. The meadows and pasture grounds are beautiful, but there is little tillage, it having been a received opinion for ages past that grain would not ripen or come to perfection so near the moors and mountains, from whence a continued moist vapour is borne into the valley, which blights the corn in its blossom, or prevents it filling or maturing. But this absurdity is declining through experience, which hath taught the inhabitants that the want of knowledge in agriculture was all the defect. This is a very ancient borough, and by prescription sends two members to Parliament. It is the county town, but is not blessed with a situation for trade. The markets are not populous, the country adjoining, by reason of its extensive wastes and uncultivated lands, being thinly inhabited. This is a corporation town, and is governed by a mayor, alderman and common council. The late conflicts in political matters have enriched the inhabitants, the contested elections for this borough having bestowed upon the burgage owners many thousands of pounds. The place where the judges of Assize sit in judgment on criminals is very antique and remarkable. By the arms placed on one of the corner pillars, it appears to have been erected by the Pembroke family. It is situated in the market place fronting to the north, is opened on the sides by a rude balustrade, and in the front is supported by pillars, so that it may be truly said the judge sits dispensing justice in the forum. The buildings in this place are chiefly ancient, some few modern houses of red free stone, which have a remarkable fine effect are interspersed. Near the summit of the hill stands an obelisk, a pillar of the Ionic order, arising on some few steps, on the base of which is cut this remarkable inscription, Preserve your liberties, maintain your rights. It seems to be placed there as a public satire on the conduct of the burgage owners, and to say, hither and no further, the conflagration of public virtue advanced. As it had its origin in the contested elections, it excites a smile of derision on the countenance of the traveller, to whose mind it renews the odious ideas of the corruptions of this age. In the midst of the town, to the disgrace of the corporation, stands a filthy slaughterhouse and shambles. There is a school amply endowed belonging to this place. Before the door of the schoolhouse some Roman altars are placed. Among these antiquities one Reginald Bainbrig has given a memorial of his folly to posterity by some inscriptions in antique characters to celebrate his own memory, in which at least his Latin inelegance, qui docuit hic, might have been spared. End of part one. Recorded at Bowes Castle on Stainmore, at Brough Castle, and at Appleby by the River Eden. Part 2 of An Excursion to the Lakes in Westmoreland and Cumberland, August 1773, by William Hutchinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. From Broome Castle to Oldswater. The road which we pursued from Appleby for several miles gave us great pleasure. The valleys through which the River Eden runs are singularly beautiful. Their woody banks and level meads afforded a variety of landscapes, particularly below Crackenthorpe. We passed by Kirby Thor, where no remains of ancient Roman grandeur, spoken of by Camden, are now to be found. Acorn Bank, the seat of William Norton, Esquire, and Temple Sowerby, laid also in our way, of which we were told nothing memorable but that there remained to this day a pecuniary mulct, paid to the lord of the manor in lieu of his custom with each bride within his jurisdiction. It is an extra parochial place, and from its ancient owners, the Knights Templars, enjoyed many privileges which are now obsolete. 
we passed Winfield Park, an extensive forest, the property of the Earl of Thanet, where we had the pleasure of viewing a large tract of ground, lately enclosed from the park, growing corn. Nothing can give greater satisfaction to the eye of the traveller than to behold cultivation and industry, stretching their paces over the heath and waste, the forest and the chase. Population must follow and riches ensue. In Winfield the remains of an ancient oak of prodigious size is shown to strangers, called Three Brother Tree, a name arising from the concealment of three brethren within its cavity. On the wayside a shattered trunk of an oak, called White Heart Tree, is seen, a contemporary perhaps of the other, though inferior in size. The monument of elapsed centuries and the effigy of old age, stretching forth its withered limbs on one side, and on the other a scanty foliage and a poor remnant of life. This tree is nine yards and two feet in circumference. A stone pillar, erected by the side of the road, next attracted our attention, near to which was placed a stone table. The stalk of the pillar is sexagon, the top of it square. On the sides of this square are represented, in several quarterings, the arms of the Pembrokes, a south dial, and the following inscription. This pillar was erected anno domini, 1656, by the Right Honourable Anne, Countess Dowager of Pembroke, etc., daughter and sole heiress of the Right Honourable George Earl of Cumberland, for a memorial of her last parting in this place, with her good and pious mother, the Right Honourable Mary, Countess Dowager of Cumberland, the 2nd of April, 1616. In memory whereof, she also left an annuity of four pound, to be distributed to the poor of the parish of Broom, every second day of April, for ever, upon the stone table here hard by. Laus Deo. We quitted the high road in order to pass by Broom Castle, a spacious ruin, situate on the banks of the river Yeoman. That we might enjoy the prospect to advantage, we crossed over the river and made a sweep around the mill, which stands almost opposite to Broom. From thence the view opened upon us delightfully. The mill with its streams lay on the foreground to the left, a beautiful and shining canal formed by the river Yeoman, margined with shrubs, laid spreading to the right. In front, the streams which fell over the weir made a foaming cascade. Immediately on the opposite bank of the channel arises Broom Castle, three square towers projecting, but yet connected with the building, form the front. From thence, on either side, a little wing falls back some paces. To the northeast, a thick grove of plains and ashes blocks up the passage and the gateway. To the southwest, the walls stretch out to a considerable distance along a fine grassy plain of pasture ground, terminated by a tower, one of the outposts of the castle. In the centre of the building arises a lofty square tower, frowning in Gothic strength and gloomy pomp. The shattered turrets which had formed the angles and the hanging gallery which had communicated with each were grown with shrubs and waving brambles. The sunbeams which struck each gasping loop and bending window discovered the inward devastation and ruin, and touched the whole with admirable colouring and beauty. To grace the landscape, fine groups of cattle were dispersed on the pasture, and through the tufts of ash trees which were irregularly dispersed on the background distant mountains were seen skirting the horizon. The lower apartment in the principal tower is still remaining entire, being covered with a vaulted roof of stone, consisting of eight arches, which, as they spring from the side walls, are supported and terminate on a pillar in the centre. The apartment mentioned to have been in Bow's Castle was assuredly of the same architecture, as appears from the remains of the groins still projecting from the walls there together with part of the elevation of the centric pillar. Having now entered the county of Cumberland, and passing on behind Carlton, the seat of James Wallace, Esquire, the eye wandered with delight over a fine cultivated country, from whence we had a distant view of the rich valley of Lowther, decked with noble and extensive woods. As we approached to Penrith, the mountains and piles of rocks which stand on Ullswater afforded an august scene, and at the termination of the road the ruins of Penrith Castle presented themselves. The genius, the virtue and industry of the owner of these rich lands which we were then passing arose to our thoughts. 
the benevolent mind must ever be touched with pleasure when the meritorious man is rewarded in this world for his excellence penrith is an agreeable town situate on the easy decline of a hill to the southward it is uncharted being governed by the steward of the honour and a jury a considerable manufactory of cotton and linen checks is carried forward here the houses in general are well built and the inhabitants are facetious and polite the name of this place is derived from the colour of the hills near it penrith being in the ancient british language a red hill here we met with the utmost civility every one we addressed showing themselves ready to give us all the information in their power of what was curious in the country our first excursion from penrith was to mount the steep hill on which the beacon is placed upwards of a mile to the northward of the town the labour was great by which we ascended this mount but the view from thence amply rewarded our fatigue the beacon house is a square building of stone and is happily situated for the purpose of alarming the country in times of public danger as it commands a very extensive vale the northern window of the beacon house affords a prospect of cross fell with the pikes of dufton together with a chain of mountains extending from east to west near thirty miles which on the western point sink in the spacious plain where the city of carlisle lies the utmost bounds of this view are formed by a ridge of scotch mountains some faint appearance of st mary's church marks to the eye the site of carlisle the eastern window presented to us a view of the country we had passed bounded by the hills of stainmore and the lofty promontory of wilbore fell above kirby stephen with its neighbouring mountains the south window returned to us the view of broom castle with its plains of pasture ground the spreading woods of lowther intermixed with rich cultivated lands form the rising grounds some parts of the lake of ulswater are seen whilst the mighty rocks and mountains which hem in the lake lift up their heads in rude confusion and crown the scene the western window affords a new and not less pleasing prospect the town of penrith lay before us and here and there the river yeoman showed its windings through its woods the hill which rises above the town is crowned with the awful remains of a royal fortress time has despoiled its grandeur but its honours still survive to its noble owner the duke of portland who therewith holds the honour of penrith formerly a royal franchise beyond these objects amongst a range of mountains at the distance of eighteen miles skiddo is seen with his majestic front surmounting all the high lands that terminate the view the whole prospect from the beacon hill as you turn every way presents you with a vast theatre upwards of one hundred miles in circumference circled with stupendous mountains common justice requires that in whatever station of life merit is discovered it should receive a degree of praise proportionate to its excellence from this universal principle which benevolence delights to cherish i must not pass in silence the deserts of our penrith host the common conduct of publicans prepossesses the mind of the traveller when he enters an inn with the unfavourable idea that your host is an unfeeling extortioner impertinent curious and imposing whoever shall visit penrith either on business or pleasure will find the keeper of the white swan the very reverse a man above his rank in sentiments above his fellows in propriety of manners his house commodious and clean his provisions excellent and his attendance prompt and not impertinent our second excursion from penrith was by lowther to the lake of ulswater we passed the village of Clifton, memorable for the skirmish on the 18th day of December 1745 between the Duke of Cumberland's forces and the rebels. On the approach to Clifton from Lowther, the way which the Duke's forces advanced, lies Clifton Moor, a spacious common, descending with an easy slope towards the village. On the western side of this moor, the road is situate within 20 yards of the enclosures which are fenced by hedges and stone walls from whence the rebels began firing on the duke's horse and made some slaughter to the east the land descends to some swamps with small enclosures at the foot of which is a narrow dark lane passable for no more than one horseman at a time near this place general honeywood received those marks of savage barbarity which had nearly cost him his life 
a little detached from the village stands a cottage where the rebel captain hamilton with some others had concealed themselves this being discovered one of the duke's hussars with great dexterity attacked the house and riding around it fired several shot in at the window which did some execution and obliged hamilton to show himself when there began a single combat between two equally experts in horsemanship and the use of arms in which hamilton was taken prisoner after giving and receiving many wounds a train of melancholy sentiments flowed in upon the mind on passing the ground rendered famous to posterity by battles and slaughter when rebellion adds its horrid dye to darken the retrospection the soul recoils at the sad and unnatural scene and tears start from the eye to weep the sins of fell ambition and the pride of man we visited the present works of sir james lowther to which he is pleased to give the name of the village the buildings of which are of stone handsomely sashed and covered with blue slate our approach was at the eastern end where the work there proceeding formed a crescent behind which the other buildings are thrown in squares the design on which the proprietor is building this beautiful place is to entertain a number of linen manufacturers the erections being calculated for that purpose with proper apartments for the directors and governors of such a work by the appearance of the place it seems as if it would be capable of receiving a thousand artists the utility and greatness of this project are too manifest to require the traveller's animadversions although it is to say that such works under the auspices of such men give the observer infinite pleasure the distances between the rich and poor in this luxurious and proud age have been too distinctly maintained the wealth and felicity of this nation depends upon the intimate connection between property and trade where opulence is diffused in works to bless the industrious poor in projects to promote manufactory and arts panegyric is silenced by that inward approbation and esteem which leads the mind to regard such virtue in the character of the rich man with reverence we passed along from this agreeable scene to a place called the college from its having been formerly the residence of the preceptors of the lowther family where our admiration was enlarged by the princely works there carried on at the sole expense of sir james we obtained admission to inspect the carpet manufactory which is there conducted in the manner of the goblins it is not possible to convey any competent idea of the beauty of this work by description the shag thrown up on the face of the carpeting is about half an inch in thickness which renders it so durable that a new erected mansion would not outstand such furniture the colours are disposed with the utmost taste and judgment in representation of natural flowers as delicate easy and just as the works of the pencil we were so fortunate as to see in the looms some carpets of particular beauty the one was wrought on a copper-coloured ground scattered with sprigs of flowers the other was on a violet ground the roses and convolvulus and jasmines and carnations were exquisite they looked like fresh pulled flowers thrown upon velvet their disposition was in the happiest taste and the colours were given to form the most agreeable changes and variety the master of this work in an open and polite manner conducted us not omitting one circumstance which he apprehended could add to our pleasure in the inspection the spinning for this work is done by children from the foundling hospital tears of pleasure gushed upon the eye to behold these poor orphans who would otherwise perhaps have been totally lost to the world and to themselves thus by so excellent a charity saved from the hands of destruction and vice rendered useful members of society and happy in their industry and innocence the carpet manufactory is carried on solely for sir james's pleasure and not for sale we were informed that some little time ago a piece of this work was presented to her majesty passing from the college we descended the banks of the river lowther whose woody scenes are everywhere picturesque and pleasing in this path how long soe'er the wanderer roves each step shall wake fresh beauties each short point present a different picture new and yet the same mason's garden the beauties of the prospect at ascombe bridge engaged our attention the water descending over a rocky channel fell in irregular and foaming streams the little plain above was dressed in the brightest green 
the lofty banks on every hand were clothed with stately oaks save only where a bold promontory which overhung the road where we had passed showed its rocky brow from out the shade which crowned its threatening front a gentleman who was so obliging as accompany us in this day's excursion conducted our route with great judgment from lowther he caused us to ascend the hills which bordered upon ulswater so that the lake was totally concealed from us in our approach till we were just upon it having attained the summit with no small degree of patience and fatigue it opened suddenly upon our view presenting to us a sheet of water of the form of an s nine miles in extent and greatly above a mile in width as we looked upon it from a great eminence we could discern all its bays its shores and promontories and in the extensive landscape take in a vast variety of objects thrown together with all that beauty which wood and water lawns rising sweeps of corn villas villages and cots surmounted by immense mountains and rude cliffs can form to the eye the country to the right for many miles was variegated in the finest manner by enclosures woods and villas amongst which greystock dacre and delmain were seen whilst to the left nothing but stupendous mountains and rude projecting rocks presented themselves to the sight vying with each other for grandeur and eminence we descended to the village of pooley and from thence by a winding road on the margin of the lake passed on for near a mile to a small inn where we left our horses we were accommodated on the water with one of the barges belonging to the duke of portland which had been sent there by his grace for pleasuring a strong south breeze rendered the lake so rough that the surf broke over the bow while the swell gave us motion almost equal to that felt at sea my companion suffered no small mortification by this accident as it incommoded him much in drawing views of this admirable scene we were obliged to coast it up the lake to keep as much under the wind as possible the labour being very great to make any way with four boatmen at the oars as we took the boat there stood to our right a mountain almost perfectly circular covered with verdure to the crown arising swiftly from the edge of the water many hundred feet in height and shadowing us from the sun to the left the lake spread out its agitated bosom whitened with innumerable breakers much above a mile in breadth whose opposite shore in one part ascended gradually with cultivated lands from the village of Pooley, skirting the hills over which some scattered wood was happily disposed in irregular groves and winding lines whilst all above the brown heath reached the summits this land adjoined to a mountain much superior in height to that upon our right rising almost perpendicular from the lake with naked cliffs on its rugged side through the grey rocks was torn a passage for a rivulet whose waters fell precipitate with a mighty noise into the deep below the ground more distant which was seen still upwards over an expanse of water not less than four miles consisted of lofty rocks and bold promontories here and there showing naked and storm-bleached cliffs and in other places scattered over with spring of young oaks arising from the stoves of trees which the axe had lately slain we could not forbear lamenting the loss of so great an ornament to this romantic scene as a forest of timber trees hanging on these declivities must have been from this and every other point of view on the lake as we passed along having doubled two small capes we fell into a bay under the seat of john robinson esq of water mellock from the very margin of the lake in this part the grass ground ascended gradually in an easy slope where were dispersed in an agreeable irregularity pretty groves of ash there many a glade is found the haunt of wood gods only where if art e'er dared to tread twas with unsandaled feet printless as if the place was holy ground mason's garden above which the easy inclining hills showed us yellow fields of corn overtopped by the white front of a venerable mansion more noted for its hospitality than for the elegance of its structure the pleasantness of this bay the verdure of the new mown meads with the shade of the grove induced us to take our noontide repast there whilst we sat to regale 
the barge put off from shore to a station where the finest echoes were to be obtained from the surrounding mountains the vessel was provided with six brass cannon mounted on swivels on the discharge of one of these pieces the report was echoed from the opposite rocks where by reverberation it seemed to roll from cliff to cliff and return through every cave and valley till the decreasing tumult gradually died away upon the ear the instant it had ceased the sound of every distant waterfall was heard but for an instant only for the momentary stillness was interrupted by returning echo on the hills behind us where the report was repeated like a peal of thunder bursting over our heads continuing for several seconds flying from haunt to haunt till once more the sound gradually declined again the voice of waterfalls possessed the interval till to the right the more distant thunder arose upon some other mountain and seemed to take its way up every winding dell and creek sometimes behind on this side or on that in wondrous speed running its dreadful course when the echo reached the mountains within the line and channel of the breeze it was heard at once on the right hand and left at the extremities of the lake in this manner was the report of every discharge re-echoed seven times distinctly at intervals we were relieved from this entertainment which consisted of a kind of wondrous tumult and grandeur of confusion by the music of two french horns whose harmony was repeated from every recess which echo haunted on the borders of the lake here the breathings of the organ were imitated there the bassoon with clarinets in this place from the harsher sounding cliffs the cornet in that from the wooded creek amongst the caverns and the trilling waterfalls you seem to hear the soft toned lute accompanied with the languishing strains of enamoured nymphs whilst in the copse and grove was still retained the music of the horns all this vast theatre seemed to be possessed by innumerable aerial beings who breathed celestial harmony as we finished our repast from a general discharge of the guns we were roused to new astonishment for although we had heard with great surprise the former echoes this exceeded them so much that it seemed incredible for on every hand the sounds were reverberated and returned from side to side so as to give us the semblance of that confusion and horrid uproar which the falling of these stupendous rocks would occasion if by some internal combustion they were rent to pieces and hurled into the lake during the time of our repast the wind was hushed and the lake which on our first entrance was troubled and foaming now became like a shining mirror reflecting reversed mountains and rocks groves meads and vales the water was so transparent that we could perceive the fish and pebbles at the depth of six or eight fathom we now doubled a woody promontory and passing by the foot of gobery park ascended into the narrow part of the lake leaving the grassy margins and the scattered copse which had bordered the water as we passed by water melloc now all around us being one scene of mountains which hemmed us in arising with awful and precipitate fronts here the white cliffs raised their pointed heads there the shaken and rifted rocks were split and cavated into vast shelves chasms and dreary cells which yawned upon the shadowed lake whilst other steeps less rugged were decked with shrubs which grew on every plain and chink their summits being embrowned with sun-parched moss and herbage the scene was nobly awful as we approached to starbury crag at every winding of our passage new hills and rocks were seen to overlook those which had but a minute before been new upon our prospect the clouds hung heavily upon the mountains rolling in gloomy volumes over their heads in some places dragging their ragged skirts along the sides of the steeps giving them a deep and melancholy shade in others admitting the sunbeams which illuminated the winding dells with a greyish light we saw within some little distance of the shore a sulphurine spring we were sorry to find this valuable gift of nature remained unanalyzed and neglected by the neighboring gentlemen it appeared to be much of the nature of harrogate spa and it is said to have shown excellent medicinal qualities to those who have used it the fishermen belonging to mr robinson were so obliging as to make us two draughts 
but we were not fortunate enough to take any very large fish. We drew trout, perch and skelly, which last is a kind of freshwater herring, all of which were of excellent flavour. They sometimes take a trout peculiar to this water, of thirty pounds weight and upwards, and eels of eight or nine pounds. After a voyage of upwards nine miles, we returned, passing down the centre of the lake. We had again arrived opposite to the woody promontory, which joins to the extreme of the cultivated lands of Water Mellock, when the view down the lake opened upon us. The meadows, the groves, the mountains and the rocks which environed the lake were disposed in the most picturesque order, bending around the margin of an expanse of water of five miles over. The lands of Water Mellock now laid at a distance to the left, surmounted by some small conic hills, the heights of Gobbery Park, that ranged westward and terminated by the grassy mountain at whose foot we passed upon our entrance. These sweetly intermingled groves, cornfields and meads, gently inclining to the lake where they sunk onto the grassy margin, or stretched into easy promontories, now lay in the happiest arrangement. To the right were the rocky steeps, down which the foaming cataract was hurried, from whence the upstretching enclosures, upon gradual declinations, formed the more distant hills, above which from hanging groves that overlooked each other, some blue rocks crowned with brown heath appeared. At the extreme of this fine crescent stood Mount Dunmorlet, of a most beautiful conical form, covered from its skirts to the crown with oaks, ashes and firs, fortunately mingled, at whose foot the single arch of Pooley Bridge, the outlet of all this mighty lake, appeared bending over a little valley, where some few cottages were scattered, over which at the extremity of the dale, Penrith Beacon formed a pleasing obelisk. The beauties of this scene were increased by the reflection given in the water, where the deep green hue was seen to mix with the olive and the grey of the adjoining objects, while the background seemed to decline in faintest purple, variegated with the deep crimson streaks of an evening sky. We hung upon our oars some time, reluctant to quit this prospect, and enjoying the music of the horns. The exquisite softness and harmony which the echoes produced here were not to be described. The music seemed to issue from some resounding temple which stood concealed behind the mountains, where the most solemn and delicate symphony was heard, as if reverberated from the brazen dome or marble colonnades, and as the breeze at intervals grew softer, one might imagine the voices of a thousand choristers had filled the lengthened chorus. It happened fortunately for us that the sun some short time before setting shone out serene. We made a little turn to look back upon the dark and rocky scene which we had passed, when the vapour which had for some time almost covered the mountains with a gloomy veil appeared to roll up upon the breeze like a mighty curtain and withdrew opening gradually to the eye the pompous theatre. No sooner were these cumbrous volumes lifted above the summits of the western hills than the horizontal rays broke in upon the mountains. The grass on these heights, which had been parched and turned of a russet hue, received the light in a delicate manner, becoming a rich shade to the bright gold tints with which the sunbeams, passing through the evening vapour, struck the cliffs, as the slantway rays pierced each valley and interstice of the mountains, here beaming over a whole hill, there tinging the tops of rocks and catching the edges of the precipice with the lustre of burnished gold. Whilst the deep shades of every vale, each dell, chasm and cave, heightened the colouring above. In the water we traced all this picturesque scene, inverted, the long and deep shadows thrown from the mountains over the lake made the objects which were thus illumined be most beautifully reflected on this mirror of sable. Here the mind was touched with pious and reverential thoughts, which alone delight in silence, while contemplation dwells on the mighty author of such wondrous works, to whom it is acceptable that the heart of man, seeking him in such scenes as these, should pay that adoration which no language can express. Approaching night roused us from our rhapsodies. The clouds above our heads were deeply tinged with crimson, and the whole lake as we proceeded on our voyage seemed to glow with a fine carnation. 
as the sun still descended the vapours which hung with a grey hue over the hills now assumed a flame colour and seemed to wind up a multitude of glowing streams in the most grotesque figures while all below was sinking from the eye into a solemn confusion the whole range of mountains appearing as if on fire the images of ovid immediately occurred to my memory caucasus ardet osake compindo majorque ambobus olympus erieke alpes et nubifer apenninus end of part two recorded at broom castle penrith churchyard ascombe bridge and pooley bridge part three of an excursion to the lakes in westmoreland and cumberland august seventeen seventy three by william hutchinson this librivox recording is in the public domain in and around penrith we regained the little inn at the foot of dunmorlet where our horses waited for us and returned towards penrith delighted with our voyage in our conversation enumerating the wondrous and enchanting scenes to which we had been present till we reached Delmain, the seat of j hazel esq the rich woods which are spread around this mansion together with its handsome stone-built front gave us expectation whilst we saw it in the morning at a distance that it would be still more pleasing on a nearer view but we could not forbear turning our eyes away in disappointment when we perceived the approach and court kept no better than a stable yard a little ramble took place in the ensuing morning on our way we were shown the tenement in which by the great tempest some few years ago miss bolton and her female friend were overwhelmed in the ruins of their house over whose untimely monument even piety lets fall a tear and resignation bows to heaven with sighs whilst hope in holy whispers tells that innocence and virtue called from hence become angelic we viewed the ruins of penrith castle it is said to have arose on the foundations of a roman fortress the traces of which are not now to be discovered the buildings form a square and are situate on a rising ground surrounded with a ditch the site towards the town is much more elevated than on any of the other quarters this front consists of the remains of an angular tower to the east which now stands separated from the rest by the falling of the walls the centre which projects a little from the plane of the front is hastening to decay presenting to the eye broken chambers passages and stairs this part of the building is still connected with the western angular tower an open hanging gallery forming the communication below this gallery a large opening is made by the falling of the building forming a rude arch through which and the broken walls to the east the interior parts of the ruin are perceived in picturesque manner nothing remains within but part of a stone arched vault which by its similitude to places of the like nature which we had formerly seen we conceived to have been the prison from thence we went to view a place by the inhabitants called arthur's round table near to yeoman bridge and within about half a mile from penrith this is said to be of great antiquity but there is no tradition when by whom or for what purpose it was made it is cut in a little plain near to the river of an exact circular figure save to the eastern and western sides an approach is left on the common level of the plain the trench which is cast up and by which it is formed is near ten paces wide the soil which has been thrown up on the outward side forms a kind of theatre the approaches are ten paces wide and the whole circle within the ditch is one hundred and sixty paces in circumference we were induced to believe this was an ancient tilting ground where in days of chivalry tournaments had been held the approaches would answer for the career and the circle seems sufficient for the champions to show their dexterity in justing and horsemanship the whole circus being capable of receiving one thousand spectators without the ditch it doth not appear probable that this hath been an entrenchment or fortified camp it being too small for such purposes and more particularly it is overlooked by an adjoining rising ground from whence it might be annoyed by missile weapons some places similar in form have been esteemed camps fortified by the danes at about half a mile distance we viewed a place called mayborough 
this is a hill which arises gradually on every side about one hundred and forty paces from the level of the lands below forming the lower section of a regular cone the ascent is on every side grown with oaks and ashes and seems to have been covered with wood for ages though no very ancient trees remain standing yet the relics left by the axe evince it the summit of the hill is fenced round save only an opening to the east of twelve paces wide the fence is very singular being composed of an immense quantity of loose pebble stones which seem to have been gathered from the river by their quality and the similarity there is between them and the gravel of the bed of the yeoman no kind of mortar appears to have been used here the stones laid uncemented and in a heap which at the foot is near twenty paces wide rising to an edge in height at this day about eight feet from the level of the interior plain here and there time has scattered a few trees and brushwood over the pebbles but in other places they are loose and naked both on the outside and inside of the fence the space within is a fine plain of meadow ground exactly circular of one hundred paces diameter inclining a little to the westward from the centre a large mass of unhewn stone is standing erect placed with the smaller end in the earth on which some little ash trees have taken their growth by striking their roots into the natural fissures of the stone this stone is in circumference near its middle twenty two feet and some inches and in height eleven feet and upwards it is a species of the freestone and has been gathered from the surface and not one in any quarry or bed of stone the inhabitants in the neighbourhood say that within the memory of man two other stones of similar nature and placed in a kind of angular figure with the stone now remaining were to be seen there but as they were hurtful to the ground had been destroyed and removed the traditional account given of this place is in no wise to be credited that it was a roman theatre where criminals had been exposed to wild beasts and that those stones were placed for the refuge and respite of the combatant in his unhappy conflict the name Mayborough induced us to believe that this had been a british fortification and that the name was a corruption of maidenburg a title given to many fortresses which were esteemed impregnable and which were boasted never to have known a conqueror but the large stone placed within the plain and those said to have been defaced within the memory of man confounded this conjecture and prompted us to an idea that the whole was a druidical monument and the name of it maybury or malberge the elevated plain the surrounding woods and this strange rude pillar render it probable that this was a temple of the druids where under the solemn shade of the consecrated grove they had exercised their religious rites and taught the multitude and also held those convocations in which they determined the rights of the people and administered public justice perhaps when they were driven out of mona and fled before the roman sword they might fortify their sacred places and gather their people into such strongholds to resist the power which had avowed their extirpation we viewed the church of penrith in the afternoon a handsome new building of red free stone well galleried and ornamented in the modern style the pillars are remarkable being one single stone the following inscription on a stone placed in the wall is singular a d m d x c v i i i fifteen ninety eight ex gravi pesti que regionibus hisce incubuit obierunt apud penrith two thousand two hundred and sixty kendall two thousand five hundred richmond two thousand two hundred carlisle one thousand one hundred and ninety six posteri avotite vos verite ezekiel eighteenth thirty two m two the plague raged in london in the thirty-sixth year of queen elizabeth's reign in the churchyard is a very remarkable monument apparently of great antiquity two pillars are placed in a direction east and west distant from each other fifteen feet at the sides of the tomb two stones are placed with an edge upwards of a kind of semicircular form these side stones do not at present show any marks of the sculptor though some have conjectured they represented boars the pillars are of one piece formed like the ancient spears and about ten feet in height and shafts are round for about seven feet high 
above which they run into a square and appear to have terminated in a point where the square point commences there are the remains of a narrow belt of ornamental frieze work the stones are so much hurt by time that it is not possible to ascertain whether the upper parts of these pillars have been adorned with figures or borne any inscription i must beg leave to dissent from the opinion of those who have presumed that this was the tomb of some of the warwicks and as their reason allege these were the representations of bears and a ragged staff the device of that family i am induced to believe that this is rather the monument of some british hero of distinction the custom of placing pillars at the head and foot of sepulchres is very ancient i have seen it mentioned in many of our historians that in the time of richard the first the bones of arthur the famous king of britain were said to have been found at glastonbury in an old sepulchre to denote which stood two pillars one at the head the other at the feet on which some inscription had been cut but could not then be read in the notes to a book entitled the history of the rebellion 1745 this monument is mentioned and said to be set up in memory of a famous old warrior sir ewan caesarius of great strength who was renowned for his exploits in inglewood forest in the destruction of wild boars in our next excursion from penrith we passed by the ancient seat of the musgraves called eden hall at the distance of three miles a stone structure built in the taste of the time of the charleses every part of the river eden which we visited was picturesque and beautiful pretty lawns and meadows and here and there fine hanging groves were dispersed on its banks whilst the borders of the channel were beautiful with rocks and the stream flowed in meanderings or cascades near to little salkeld on the summit of a large hill inclining a little towards the north we had the pleasure of seeing a large and perfect druidical monument called by her country people meg and her daughters a circle of 350 paces circumference is formed by massy stones most of which remain standing upright there are 67 in number of various qualities unhewn or touched with any tool and seem from their form to have been gathered from the surface of the earth some are of blue and grey limestone some of granite and some flints many of them which were standing measured from 12 to 15 feet in girt and 10 feet in height others were of an inferior size at the southern side of this circle at the distance of 17 paces from its nearest member is placed an upright stone naturally of a square form being a red free stone with which the country about penrith abounds this stone is placed with one of its angles towards the circle is near 15 feet in girt and 18 feet high each angle of its square answering to a cardinal point in the most contiguous parts of the circle four large stones are placed in a square form as if they had constructed or supported the altar and towards the east west and north two large stones are placed a greater distance from each other than any of the rest as if they had formed the entrances into this mythic round what creates great astonishment to the spectator is that no such stones or any quarry or bed of stones are to be found within a great distance of this place and how such massy bodies could be moved in an age when the mechanical powers were little known is not to be conceived whilst we stood admiring this place the following thoughts occurred to my memory mark yon altar this wide circus skirted with unhewn stone they awe my soul as if the very genius of the place himself appeared and with terrific tread stalk through this drear domain know that thou stands on consecrated ground the mighty pile of magic planted rock thus ranged in mystic order marks the place where but at times of holiest festival the druid leads his train mason's caractacus my ideas wandered in the fields of imagination over the druid sacrifice of the milk-white steers consecrated by the mistletoe i reflected on the trembling enthusiastic multitudes 
who here perhaps had assembled to hear the priestly dictates touching government and moral conduct, to learn the druid's arrogant philosophy and superstitions, and cherish an implicit faith of the immortality of man's intellectual spirit, though in transmigration to reptiles and beasts of prey. Perhaps here princes submissively have stood to hear the haughty druid exclaim, Thou art a king, a sovereign o'er frail men. I am a druid, servant of the gods. Such service is above such sovereignty. Mason's Caractacus In the number of stones, Camden was mistaken, as they are only 67 in all. He took many of his northern remarks from hearsay only, from whence he was liable to the errors discovered in him. As to the heaps of stones within the circle, which he was told covered those slain in fight, there is not the least appearance of any such thing. Since the monuments of Mona, now Anglesey, have been so learnedly visited and defined, there is not the least reason to doubt this at Salkeld is a druidical monument, from its similarity to those remaining there. Near to a place called Nine Churches we visited two caves, the one hollowed in the rock of a circular form, with seats cut in its sides, the roof being supported in the midst by a rude pillar or mason work. This is called the Giant's Cave. The other cave is also circular, with a stone table in the midst. There is no tradition to lead one to conjecture by whom these caves were made. Their antiquity is greatly to be doubted. They seem as if they had been the work of some religious for retirement. But the name of no such person remains to us. We also visited a place called Force Mill, near to Great Salkeld, where a cave was said to be the object of travellers' curiosity. Here we found some seats cut under the shelves of a rock, commanding a romantic view upon the River Eden, but no otherwise remarkable. The falls of the river, the hanging rocks, rich meadows and hills, clothed with wood, presented us with prospects which amply repaid the disappointment our curiosity sustained. We lamented to see such extensive wastes and uncultivated lands adjoining to so beautiful a place as Penrith, whose situation must necessarily circumscribe its trade. The women of this country are remarkably beautiful. The bold, unintelligent stare, the fluttering, inconsistent pertness and lisping nonsense, so characteristic of the sex in southern counties, are here totally neglected, for intelligent looks clothed in modesty and politeness united with simplicity of manners. We had the pleasure of seeing some botanical paintings executed by Miss Calvin of this place, which in delicacy of colouring and taste in the disposition of the foliage and flowers, together with the justness of the work, may vie with any painting of that kind in Europe. To the honour of Lady Mary Lowther, this young lady is under her patronage, by whom it is not to be doubted her extraordinary merits will be made known to the world. This place owns another very remarkable genius, Mr. Fowl, who, though blind from his infancy, can perform any piece of musical composition on the harpsichord. Having the piece set by wooden pins in a board, after the manner of a cribbage board, which, after perusing by the feeling of his fingers, from the strong retention of his memory, he performs with great accuracy. The way from Penrith to Keswick, though a good turnpike, is yet very dull and tedious, for during the course of eighteen miles we met with nothing to amuse, till we arrived near the place. The mountains we passed are of various figures, and some very lofty, and as we still advanced nearer to Keswick, they straightened the valley in which we rode. We now gained a view of the Vale of St. John's, a very narrow dell, hemmed in by mountains, through which a small brook makes many meanderings, washing little enclosures of grass ground, which stretch up to the risings of the hills. In the widest part of the dale you are struck with the appearance of an ancient ruined castle, which seems to stand upon the summit of a little mount, the mountains around forming an amphitheatre. The massive bullock shows a front of various towers, and makes an awful rude and gothic appearance, with its lofty turrets and its ragged battlements. We trace the galleries, the bending arches, the buttresses. 
the greatest antiquity stands characterized in its architecture the inhabitants near it assert it is an antediluvian structure the traveller's curiosity is roused and he prepares to make a nearer approach when that curiosity is put upon the rack by his being assured that if he advances certain genii who govern the place by virtue of their supernatural arts and necromancy will strip it of all its beauties and by enchantment transform the magic walls upon his approach the veil seems like the habitation of such beings its gloomy recesses and retirements look like the haunts of evil spirits there was no delusion in the report we were soon convinced of its truth for this piece of antiquity so venerable and noble in its aspect as we drew near to it changed its figure and proved no other than a shaken massive pile of rocks which stand in the midst of this little vale disunited from the adjoining mountains and have so much the real form and resemblance of a castle that they bear the name of the castle rocks of st john's the delusion afforded us matter of laughter till we descended towards the vale of keswick the town of keswick lying in a deep valley was not to be seen till we were within a very little distance as we descended the hill a fine prospect opened upon us the hills on the right of the road are very grand enclosures of meadow and pasture take up about one third of the ascent the creeks are everywhere grown with wood which climbs up shade above shade and their crowns are covered with herbage and heath beneath us lay a plain of about three miles diameter diversified with plots of corn agreeably mingling with the meadows and here and there little cops of ashes the lake of Bassnet, which has nothing remarkable to engage the traveller's attention but a long canal of water terminated the plain to the right the lake of keswick to the left around which mountains piled on mountains made an awful circle and seemed to shut them in from all the world keswick is but a mean village without any apparent trade the houses are homely and dirty there is a town house in the market-place said to be erected out of the ruins of lord durnwater's mansion but of the most uncouth architecture there are very indifferent accommodations here for travellers nothing is more disagreeable to people who wish to see everything that is curious in a place they visit than to meet with a drunken sopiferous innkeeper whose small share of natural intelligence is totally absorbed and who has nothing remaining of human but his distorted image and his impertinence such was our host at keswick end of part three recorded in penrith church and churchyard and meg's circle part four of an excursion to the lakes in westmoreland and cumberland august seventeen seventy three by william hutchinson this librivox recording is in the public domain derwent water from a short description of the beauties of keswick which was written by the late ingenious dr brown and which we had then in our hands we were impatient to enter upon the lake and thought every delay irksome which kept us from the enchanting scene we hasted thither and from cockshoot hill took a general survey of the lake which though inferior in size to Hullswater, is yet very different in its beauties and afforded us many delightful scenes the water which still bears the name of dern water though embodied in so great a lake said to be ten miles in circumference was transparent as crystal and shining as a mirror over whose surface five fine islands were dispersed the nearest in view was covered with yellow corn the rest clothed in wood the hills are lofty arising on every side from the margin of the lake here the mountains were in some parts covered with grass in others heath there the rocks were grown with shrubs and brushwood which hung in their apertures and creeks little valleys of cultivated land presented themselves in the openings and windings of the mountains and small enclosures and groves of oaks stretched up the precipitous ascents of every hill from the brink of the water save only at the head of the basin where the mountains were more rugged and romantic we hurried to the boat that we might enjoy the pleasures of this place in their greatest perfection the general view was magnificent and beautiful 
but we wanted to take each pleasing scene apart we ordered the boatmen to coast round the nearest island called vickers island containing about six acres of corn land on the eastern side of which a few sycamores formed a little grove covering a hovel which varied the hue with a rich green and gave to the whole a picturesque appearance here we found a sweet shade whilst we hung upon our oars to listen to the sound of the waterfalls which struck the ear from every side with an agreeable solemnity now we had the valley to the right opening upon our view and extending a rich plain towards the northwest three or four miles in breadth the strips of corn and little groves scattered here and there gave the most pleasing variety when contrasted with the verdure of the mown meads struck by the rays of the morning sun and happily opposed to the adjoining mountains in this vale the church with some seat houses showed their white fronts over which the mountains arising to the right were stupendous and gloomy as they stood covered with clouds there skiddo raised his head and with a peaked brow overlooked saddleback and causey pike together with a chain of mountains stretching away towards the northwest whilst on the other hand the hills and rocks which stand on the bassnet water form the other wing of an lofty avenue of mountains which extend into the distant plains we were told by a person we met with at keswick that skiddow from the plain of the lake surface is three thousand four hundred and fifty feet in perpendicular height but as we had no means of proving the truth of this calculation must leave it to others to ascertain we coasted the right hand side of the lake where the hills gradually retiring from its margin rise to their summits covered with herbage here we had a view of the little valley of newland which winds about the feet of the mountains and with the finest verdure from the small enclosures of grass ground refreshes the eye which had laboured with upstretched looks over the vast heights that on every side shut it in there cattle and sheep were seen pasturing some little cottages were dispersed amongst the hedgerow ashes whilst the shadows of the hills suffered the sunshine to fall only in strips over the vale we landed at st herbert's island which contains about five acres of land now covered with young trees famous for being the residence of st herbert a priest and confessor who to avoid the intercourse of man and that nothing might withdraw his attention from unceasing mortification and prayer chose this island for his abode the scene around him was adapted to his gloomy ideas of religion he was surrounded by the lake which afforded him fish for his diet on every hand the voice of waterfalls excited the solemnest strains of meditation rocks and mountains were his daily prospect where barrenness and solitude seemed to take up their eternal abode from the situation of this place nature had given three parts of the year to impetuous hurricanes and storms the fourth alone provided for the rest here this recluse erected an hermitage the remains of which appear to this day being a building of stone formed into two apartments the outward one about twenty feet long and fifteen broad the other of narrower dimensions he was a contemporary with saint cuthbert and as the legends of that time say by the prayers of that saint obtained a joint or equotemporary death with him in the year of our lord 688 the passion for solitude and a recluse life which reigned in the days of this saint and was cherished by the monastic school although at first sight may appear to us uncouth and enthusiastic yet when we examine into those times our astonishment will cease whilst we consider the estate of those men who under all the prejudices of education were living in an age of ignorance vassalage and rapine and we shall rather applaud than condemn a devotee who disgusted with the world and the sins of men consigns his life to the service of the deity in retirement we may suppose we hear the saint exclaiming with the poet blessed be that hand divine which gently laid my heart at rest beneath this humble shed the world's a stately bark on dangerous seas with pleasure seen but boarded at our peril here on a single plank thrown safe on shore i hear the tumult of the distant throng as that of seas remote or dying storms and meditate on scenes more silent still 
pursue my theme and fight the fear of death. Here, like a shepherd gazing from his hut, touching his reed or leaning on his staff, eager ambition's fiery chase I see. I see the circling hunt of noisy men. Burst law's enclosure, leap the mounds of right, pursuing and pursued, each other's prey, as wolves for rapine, as the fox for wiles, till death that mighty hunter earths them all. Young. I fell into a reverie, and begun to mutter thus to myself. It seems unnatural for man to deny himself of the aid and consolation which are derived from society, and to contemn the sweets of friendship. The poet says, Poor is the friendless master of a world. When we talk of friendship in general, the friendship of the world, we are amusing ourselves with a superficial view, where objects are so grouped and colours fall in such a happy assemblage that all is beautiful and delighting. But when greater curiosity or necessity demands a strict survey of the several images which formed this pleasing prospect, you find on their separation that they lose that excellence which their union or their distance maintained. There is little of true friendship on this stage to enhance the value of life. The corruptions of the age have contaminated it, and scarce anything more is left than the name. When it is even found with consanguinity, it is a rare essence at which men stand agape. I have known examples where genius and merit have dawned upon a youth, surrounded with opulent friends, who have stood gazing on him like statues of stone, without stretching forth a hand to save him from poverty, whilst the fine gifts that providence had endowed him with languished in fetters, which by their patronage might have been brought forth and saved, even by the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. I doubted not the eye of heaven regarded their insensibility with kindling wrath, and to reward the sacrilege, deprived them of every enjoyment with which the finer feelings of the soul bless mankind, and left them nothing but the animal economy and the disgraced image of humanity. I had shown some distortions in my agitation through this whispered soliloquy, but uttering these last words with a degree of vehemence, Arising on the progress of my ideas, my companion catched me by the arm and roused me, saying, The boatmen already think they've got a passenger that is frantic, and express by their looks their wishes to be rid of us. But to return to our hermit, there is no history of his life and actions to be met with, or any tradition of his works of piety or miracles, preserved by the inhabitants of the country. We now pursued our voyage by a noble woody scene, where Brandelow Park, arising from the edge of the lake with stately young oaks, extends its groves over two round hose or eminences, and behind them, after covering a little intervening valley, rises on the side of a mountain to a considerable height, and forms a woody amphitheatre fringed with some small strips of corn, which grow under its skirts, whilst all above are stupendous hills and rocks. The straight boles of the trees, together with the verdure of the ground under their shadow, which was perceived a great depth in the grove, by reason of the distance at which the trees stood from each other, formed an uncommon and solemn scene, which being again represented by the reflection of the water, seemed like enchanted haunts, where dryads met with naiads, in the happy regions of the genius of the lake. We arrived at the borders of Manisty Meadow, a flat of a few acres at the foot of the mountains, where we anchored our boat to enjoy the pleasures of the situation. To the left, the nearest object was a wooded island, edged with rocks, behind which Brandelow Park and Oaken Groves, dressed in the deepest green, covered the hills which arose immediately from the margin of the lake, and from then stretched up to the foot of Cat Bell's Mountain which laid so near to us that it required the eye which viewed its summit to be turned upwards directly to heaven. On our right, at the distance of about 100 yards, laid another small island on whose rocky margin rushwood and willows hung fantastically, above whose thickets the distant shores were seen, where the mighty cliffs of falcon and wallow crags projecting showed their grotesque and tremendous brows in a lofty line of rocks 
beneath the feet of which a strip of cultivated lands and woods shot forth a verdant promontory which sunk gradually into the lake in the centre of this view after stretching the eye for the distance of three miles over a basin of the clearest and smoothest water spreading its bosom to the noontide sun is a large mount called castlehead rocks rising in a cone and covered with oak wood behind which a lofty mountain raised its brown brow dressed in heath and sunburnt herbage exceeded only by skiddo covered with blue vapour and capped with clouds which terminated the prospect Holswater gives you a few but noble and extensive scenes which yield astonishment whilst Keswick abounds with variety with wilder and more romantic prospects after passing Bank Park a rocky and barren promontory on which a few scattered trees looked deplorably aged and torn we entered a fine bay where the mountains rise immediately out of the lake here standing perpendicular there falling back in ruinous and rude confusion as being piled heap on heap from the convulsions of chaos in the beginning and in other parts shelving and hanging over the lake as if they threatened an immediate fall the whole forming a stupendous circus to describe this view is difficult as no expression can convey an idea of the subject where the wild variety consists only of various features of the same objects rocks and mountains forming and constituting the parts of this massive theater in the front of this romantic scene a small mount presents itself covered with herbage small from the mighty stature and gigantic members of the other parts of the prospect overlooking this mount stands a round rock pushing his mountainous brow into the clouds on the summit of the mount sweetly contrasted by the grey rocks behind there grows with peculiar picturesque beauties a single ancient oak the lake beneath was a perfect mirror o'er which the giant oak himself a grove flings his romantic branches and beholds his reverend image in the expanse below mason's garden on each hand the cliffs and mountains are strewed over with bushes and shrubs down whole sides small streams of water trill like so many threads of silver giving a delicate mixture to the greyness of the rocks over which they passed and which in many places arise perpendicular and are rent into a thousand rude columns as if they had been torn by thunderbolts in other places they are of a tamer aspect and compacted in one solid mass stand with firmness as the pillars of the antediluvian world where the hills were separated little vales filled with wood or narrow winding dells of grass ground twist around their feet and give a happy variegation to the view in some places clefts in the rocks afforded a prospect into a valley behind in others the overhanging cliffs formed rude arches and apertures through which distant mountains were discovered behind all were mountains piled on mountains where the clouds rolled in heavy volumes giving a gloominess to those regions of confusion and barrenness which rendered the lustre of the shining lake and the streams of light which fell upon the rocks waterfalls and shrubs brighter and more pleasing here e'en in the dull unseen unseeing dell shall contemplation imp her eagle plumes the poet here shall hold sweet converse with his muse the curious sage who comments on great nature's ample tome shall find that volume here for here are caves where rise those gurgling rills that sing the song which contemplation loves here shadowy glades where through the tremulous foliage darts the ray that gilds the poet's daydream mason's garden in the cliffs in this part of the lake eagles build their nests far removed above the reach of gunshot and undisturbed by men for no adventurous foot ever dared to assail their lofty habitation in the sight of the cottager hither they bring the spoils of the fold or the field to feed their young superior to the wrath of the injured on these shores a salt spring of very salubrious quality is found but like the sulphur spring of holdswater is neglected we next visited a very extraordinary phenomenon an island about forty yards in length and thirty in breadth grown over with rushes reeds grass and some willows 
we would have landed upon it but as the water was said to be forty fathom deep in that place and the attempt rather hazardous we desisted and had not the means of inquiring particularly into its nature this island arose about four perpendicular feet above the surface of the water on which it floated from its magnitude we were not able with one boat to try whether it would move from the perpendicular line of its then station or whether it was bound to and connected with the bottom of the lake by the roots of any aquatic plants which appeared upon its surface the boatman told us that it had not floated for two years before and that it is seen at many seasons by reason of the clearness of the water a great way from the surface of its action of rising or subsiding as it frequently descends to and rests upon the bottom of the lake but it never shifts its station this change of floating or sinking cannot be affected by any greater or less quantity of water in the lake at any one season for on inquiry we found in the rainy seasons the lake is very little increased in height its outlets receiving the additional water as fast as it flows in we now pushed up the river which feeds the lake and anchored near a little but pleasant habitation called Loch Dor or Lodor, a place perfectly adapted for the abode of a recluse and much preferable to St. Herbert's Island, lying open to the southern sun, sheltered from the north by mighty mountains which almost overhang it, and fronting to the widest part of the basin. It commands a view of the several islands, Manistee Meadows and Brandelow Parks, with their oaken groves hanging from the ascent of the mountains shade above shade catbells and the adjoining crags surmounting all we were landed on a plain of meadow ground which descended to the edge of the water over which we passed to an adjoining wood at the foot of the rocks behind the lodor house after winding through several passes in these groves and thickets we gained a situation where we were delighted with the noble objects which presented themselves to our view around us was spread a grove formed of tall young oaks ash and birch trees which gave an agreeable coolness and shade above the trees with uplifted looks to the right we viewed a mountain of rock called shepherd's crag forming a rude circular mass shelving from the foot towards its crown in a spiral form on every plane of which and every step that hung upon its sides herbage and shrubs grew fantastically whilst the very summit wore a verdant cap of grass to the left there arose a perpendicular grey cliff said to be a thousand feet in height from the lake rent into innumerable fissures and standing like massive columns in rude arrangement to support the seeming ruins of a shattered tower grown white with storms and overlooking shepherd's crag some hundred feet in the opening between these stupendous rocks the river pours its whole stream forming a grand cascade near two hundred perpendicular feet high as the channel is rugged the water makes a sheet of foam and roars amongst the caverns and the cliffs so that you are deprived of hearing anything beside its tumult reaching the wood where the descent is less precipitate it winds amongst the trees sometimes showing itself and at others totally concealed while it serpentines towards the lake the spray which is dashed around the rocks and carried upon the breeze wherever it meets the rays of the sun through the openings of the cliffs takes the colours of the rainbow one would conceive thompson had this cataract in his eye when he wrote his seasons smooth to the shelving brink a copious flood rolls fair and placid where collected all in one impetuous torrent down the steep it thundering shoots and shakes the country round at first and as your sheet it rushes broad then whitening by degrees as prone it falls and from the loud resounding rocks below dashed in a cloud of foam it sends aloft a hoary mist and forms a ceaseless shower nor can the tortured wave here find repose but raging still amid the shaggy rocks now flashes o'er the scattered fragments now aslants the hollow channel rapid darts and falling fast from gradual slope to slope with wild infracted course and lessened roar it gains a safer bed and steals at last along the mazes of the quiet vale on turning from this grand spectacle the greatest beauties of this lake are thrown into one prospect the ground whereon we stood was rugged and rocky 
shadowed with trees, looking over a rich bosom of wood. Below us lay the Lodor meadows, where groups of cattle were dispersed, and by the shore some carpenters were repairing their boats, a circumstance which enlivened the scene. The shining lake laid in one smooth plain, reflecting the azure sky, chequered with clouds, over which the vicar's island, yellow with corn, and the woody islands were fortunately arranged. The mountains, whose feet were trimmed with wood, lay in long perspective to the left, Castlehead, with its embowered cone and Lord's Island arising from the opposite shore, intervened between us, and the Vale of Keswick, which laid on the background, coloured with all the beauteous tinctures of summer, over which the awful Skiddo, with his inferior race of mountains, frowned in azure majesty, and closed the scene. Here were all those beauties of colouring which the late Dr. Brown described the natural variety and colouring which the several objects produce is no less wonderful than pleasing the ruling tints of the valley being those of azure green and gold yet ever various arising from an intermixture of the lake the woods the grass and cornfields these are finely contrasted by the grey rocks and cliffs and the whole heightened by the yellow streams of light the purple hues and misty azure of the mountains in this prospect one finds all the order and beauty of colouring mentioned by Mason, vivid green, warm brown and black opaque, the foreground bears conspicuous, sober olive coldly marks the second distance, thence the third declines in softer blue, or lessening still, is lost in faintest purple. Claude, in his happiest hour, never struck out a finer landscape. It has every requisite which the pencil can demand and is perhaps the only view in England which can vie with the sublime scenes from which that painter formed his taste. We now return to our boat, and sailing within some little distance of the shore, had a view of the waterfall, where the beauties of the lake to the southeast lay in a pleasing perspective. We looked over a small part of the basin, from whence to the left a stupendous mountain of rock arose on whole skirts, and in the rents and clefts of whose sides trees and shrubs climbed almost to the very summit. Before us lay the wood from which we had lately passed, under whose shade Lodor House and enclosures were seen inclining towards the lake, above which the lofty precipice, the waterfall and shepherd's crag were seen, in all their variety of beauties, whilst all beyond the mountains formed a crescent, enclasping a sheet of water of two miles circuit mountain behind mountain and rock behind rock fell here in fine perspective and brought to our minds those astonishing scenes which characterize the pencil of Salvatore. We passed from hence in our return to Keswick by the coast where we were shown a cliff that projected over the lake called Eve's Crag from its bearing some similitude to a female Colossian statue. We next passed Wallow Crag in which a large opening is formed by the parting of the rocks, bearing the name of Lady's Rake, from the escape which Lady Dernwater made there, by climbing these horrid and stupendous heights with such jewels and valuables as she could secure when her unfortunate lord was apprehended for a traitor. We now reached Lord's Island, containing some few acres covered with wood, where are the remains of a mansion of the Dernwater family, Formerly this was only a peninsula, but when the place was made the residence of the Radcliffs and Dernwaters, it was severed from the mainland by a ditch, over which was thrown a drawbridge. This must have been a beautiful retirement. Travellers cannot behold the ruins of this place without yielding a sigh for the sins of the world and bewailing the dire effects which attend on ambition and the crimes of princes. End of part four. Recorded by Derwent Water at Keswick.